love it. Cool. Yeah. And then he'll probably film his stuff at FCC. I hope he can get some kind of mic so it's not like so echoey. Good morning, Fairview family and friends. Happy New Year. Happy 21. Saw a funny meme that said, uh-oh, 2020 is about to turn 21. I don't know what that means. It's going to get into trouble or something. It's going to be a great year. We know that it doesn't have to do much to exceed the past year. So I'm sure it's going to be wonderful great things are in store. I know it didn't all 
switch overnight. Yeah. Nothing changed overnight. But we know in the next year, things are going to get better. It's just called hope, right? You with me? Yeah, we all have hope for this new year. Um, good morning to everyone who's joining us on Facebook. I see uh, Libby and Rebecca. Good morning, ladies. Nice to have you with us. Good to see you on here. Good morning, Adam and Asunta. And might I say, you're looking great today. <laughs> I know they look good. I gave them both a haircut yesterday. And good morning, Walt in Las Vegas. Nice. And Matthew, good to see you. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy Epiphany Sunday. That's today we're going to be celebrating. If we were in church all together, which we will be, we will be this year. I have every faith. But if we were together today, this Sunday, we would um, be joining together for fellowship out on the patio and we would have a king's cake and everyone would get a piece. And whoever found the, the little baby Jesus in the cake would be hosting the party. And I think that's a like a Mardi Gras kind of party. I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see what comes with a Mardi Gras and all the <laughs> holidays coming up. The holidays aren't over. Some holidays are over, but there's always more to come. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Britt. Yay. High fives. Good morning, Toms and Ardith from Kansas. Nice to see you. Good morning, Fairview. I love seeing all your names. I love seeing your faces too. And I will hope that you join us for Zoom afterwards so we can see some faces too. I know you're seeing mine right now, but we wanna see the screen full of as many of us as we can. So I hope you join catch up. Tell us how your holidays were. Oh, happy birthday, Cindy. Thanks, Libby, for reminding me. Happy birthday, Cindy. Cindy's taking the day off, a well-deserved day off. Boy, she works hard for our church, and we appreciate it so much. We appreciate all of you just for showing up, <laughs> for being a part of our community. We can't be Fairview Community church without our community, our fellowship of believers, our faith group. I love having you in my life. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Rick says, King Cake is a New Orleans Mardi Gras tradition. Yeah, so I thought it was connected with Mardi Gras in some way. Fat Tuesday. That's a fun one. How was your New Year's? Did you have a, did you ring it in, stay up till midnight? <laughs> I know some people like to celebrate on New Year's Eve, New York time. That's more my speed. I can't really stay up. I can't even remember the last time I stayed up till midnight. It, I don't even think I did once in 2020. It's probably been years. <laughs> Who knows? But I did stay up till the the break of 10 o'clock. I know I broke 10 o'clock, but that's about, that's about as best I could do. I did a puzzle. We watched some TV and went to bed. Nothing special. <laughs> well, we are going to go on with our church service, our Epiphany Sunday. We will be having communion today, so you might want to grab your stuff. And again, I look forward to seeing you on Zoom afterwards. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Great to have you with us. See you soon. Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, my name is Mike Karakas. I'm the moderator here at Fairview Community Church, and I am so glad that you are here with us this morning for our Sunday worship. It's first worship service of 2021. We made it through 2020. Um, everything is perfect again. <laughs> no, it's not. But um, we're, we're, we're all uh, still, still here and doing our best, and uh, we're glad that you're here to join us this morning. Uh, for those of you who are new or, or new-ish to our, our church, I'll tell you a little bit about us. Uh, Fairview Community Church is a dual denominational church of both the American Baptist Churches USA and the United Church of Christ. 
We're also an open, welcoming, and affirming congregation. And most importantly, around here, no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. That's something that we take very close to heart around here. All right, uh, you know, on um, there was a time where we would meet in person over at uh, Fair and Fairview in Costa Mesa, California, here in Orange County. Uh, we have been on hold for, for that, uh, for public safety reasons. And so un until further notice, you can see us here every Sunday morning, 10 a.m. on our Facebook page, as well as our church website, ocfairviewchurch.org. Um, the video that we, we play on the, the website, which is also live at, at 10 o'clock, is not associated with Facebook at all, if that's something that's um, important to you. Uh, but those of us, those of you who are here on Facebook Live with us, now would be a great time to share. You can share this video. There should be a share link somewhere around here. You can you can tap, and uh, you can you can get the word out. I've I've tried to share most Sundays. My coworkers have uh, joined me for church, uh, amongst other people. It's a great way to get the word out, and um, the the whole whole world can fit in a pew these days. So. Um, so that's a great thing to do if you can. All right, let's see. We um, don't really have any announcements this week other than, uh, well, today is, is communion. It is the first Sunday of the month when we tip, uh, typically do our communion. So feel free to grab some kind of communion elements for, for later. Um, it really can be, it can be anything. Um, I've got some coffee here and I've got the, um, some leftover Hawaiian sweet rolls I'll be using with uh, my daughter here for communion. Uh, but you can do anything you want. Have, have some wine and unleavened bread if you want to be traditional. I won't judge. Wine before noon. And uh, that's happening today. Also, I encourage you if you um, if you missed it, we had some technical issues on our Christmas Eve service. Some of the people who were uh, watching it live uh, weren't able to, to see this whole service. So we have our Christmas Eve service up on our website, ocfairbychurch.org. And if you um, want a little extra Christmas spirit, keep that Christmas wave going. Uh, you can go there. And it was a beautiful service. We had some incredible music. If you didn't get a chance to see it, I highly encourage you to, to do so. It was, um, it, it, it's a good one. So um, let's see. I want to thank everyone who helped out with our service today. It takes a lot of people every week to make church happen these days. So thank you everyone who's volunteered, everyone on our music team. You guys are incredible with your, your music every week. Um, so thank you, everyone who reads and, and helps assemble this and everything. Um, it, is, it is a treat and we appreciate all the work you do for us. Uh, after service today, we do have a fellowship time on Zoom. And this week, take note, we have changed the link. That is a different Zoom link than what we've had before. Uh, we're actually taking a slightly different approach. So now, if you go to ocfairviewchurch.org slash zoom. That will take you straight to the correct zoom link. Whatever that may be, week to week, that link will always take you to the right right place for our, our fellowship time. So ocfairviewchurch.org slash zoom. It's something that humans can write and read <laughs> and type out. Unlike before, we had the real zoom link with the X, Y, J, Q, all that stuff on there. Uh, so please uh, you know, take, take note of that. I hope to see you after church for our fellowship time. All right, so uh, before I pass things over to, to Pastor Rick, I wanted to, to make a note of, of something. Uh, so we've, we've had Pastor Rick with us for the last uh, month and a half now or, or so. Um, I think he's been doing a, a great job. Um, but in addition to doing all the you know, full-time pastor things that he does, he has a secret agenda. Now, what is that secret agenda? It's not actually, actually not so secret. As our intentional interim pastor, Rick is here to not only do all, all the pastor stuff, but to help us along our way, our journey, to finding a, and calling a new full-time senior pastor. This is a long process. It's going to take the rest of the year, most likely. Uh, and he is going to help us discover kind of who we are as a church, what we want from, from a new pastor, and where we want this church to, to go in the future. 
So now that we're pretty much through the holidays and we're starting off the year on a, on a new foot, our first order of business of all of that is creating not one, but two church profiles because we are a dual denomination church. We're going to be creating church profiles for the American Baptist Churches USA and the UCC uh, side of our congregation. These are kind of like dating profiles <laughs> for, for a church. Um, not, maybe not as fun as a dating profile, uh, but some of the same ideas. What, do, what are our likes and dislikes? What are we looking for in a partner? That sort of thing. Um, but uh, being, being a church is really looking at ourselves and saying, you know, where, what are our core beliefs and, and what, do we, um, what do we want to be doing in our community? Not just you and me and you and you and you, but our greater community. What kind of pastor do we want to help us turn this church into what we want it to be? Um, do we want someone who's focused in, in this area or that area? Um, do we want someone who, you know, you, you could really think of any, any part of what makes a church a church. Maybe we're going to really focus in on, on kids. Maybe we're going to really focus in on justice. Maybe we're going to do, um, all, who knows, all kinds of stuff. Maybe we'll build a water park. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm thinking of water park. Um, so Rick now is going to be helping us, you know, intentionally work through that process, discover and answer those questions, create those profiles, get our pastoral search committee put together, and and go on that journey to to call someone. So that'll be coming up in the in the coming weeks and, and months, um, and it's a very participatory process. So uh, get some some juices uh, flowing up here for for what you might uh, be feeling about our, our our church and where you you want this to to go. Um, it, it's our church. We can. We can make it what we want. Uh, he has been sneaking in some, <laughs> some, some thoughts along these lines in his sermons as well. Uh, last week he had mentioned, um, he was talking about the word, and he was saying, you know, what kind of word would you think about when you think of Fairview Community Church? Like, what word would you use to describe it? Um, yeah, th th things like that. We've got to start, uh, start thinking about these things. So, so that's coming up. Um, if you have any questions, thoughts, etc. about that, you can reach out to, um, to Rick, you can reach out to myself or any other board members, and this year our board is myself, Carrie Lester, Elena, Britt, and Jeff Johnston. I hear that kid's got some spunk, so we're <laughs> excited for that. Um, it's going to be a, a, a transformative year for us, an exciting year. And uh, we're, we're glad that you're, you're here with us. Uh, and, if, oh, and if you need to get in touch with any of us, don't have our information, you can also reach out to Cindy at the office, um, office at ocfairviewchurch.org, and she will uh, point you in the right direction. All right. Well, thanks for listening to me. I will now pass it over to Rick for our call to worship. Thanks, Mike. And good morning, Fairview and friends. Let me add my greetings as we join together in this virtual worship service. Wherever you are and whoever you are, know that you're welcome here. At Fairview Community Church, we're all about widening the circle and enlarging the table. Thanks to everyone who worked so hard to put this service together. Let me say a word about this morning's music. Mike Phillips is on a well-deserved vacation this Sunday and next, so we're using archive music from our own files, plus a couple of solos. I'll be singing "Twas in the Moon of Wintertime, <clears throat> a setting of the Tale of the Magi from a Native American perspective to a Native melody. Though you can't see her accompanying me on the piano is my friend and colleague, Jan Gunderson, former music director here at First Baptist Palo Alto. The other solo is by Jenny Selig in the bleak midwinter. Jenny is the daughter of retired American Baptist pastors, Alan and Karen Selig. She's involved in Judson Memorial Church in New York City. We enjoyed her music last Sunday and on Christmas Eve as well. 
One announcement I wanted to call your attention to is that this week on January 6th at 5.30 Pacific time, the Association of Welcoming and Affirming Baptists will be holding a special service on Epiphany, commemorating the disfellowshipping of five American Baptist churches 25 years ago for their membership in the Association of Welcoming and Affirming Baptists. This will be a moving service. Um, I, I'll be bringing the final word of hope for the future. And we'd love to have you join us. The link is in our Keeping Up with Fairview Community. And uh, we'll make sure that you all know uh, what the link is for that service. So we invite you to come and be part of it. Today is Epiphany Sunday when we celebrate the visit of the Magi to the stable in Bethlehem. These seers followed a mysterious star in search of a child born to be a king. But what sort of king is born in a stable and laid in a manger, the child of peasant parents? Hear these words of preparation from the pen of Jürgen Moltmann. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The message of the prophet, he says, is a message for the people, a message sent into the camps of the exiled and into the slums of the poor. It is a word against the captains of the arms industry and the fanatics of power. If we really understood what it means, it bursts the bonds of Sunday worship. For if the message really lays hold of us, it leads us to Jesus, the liberator, and to the people who live in darkness and who are waiting for him, for us. Let us worship. Gather wondering, where will we find the babe born in Bethlehem? We will find the babe in the laughter of children, in the wisdom of grandparents. 
we gather asking, where will we find the child of Christmas? We will find the child where the needy are gifted with hope, where the oppressed are set free. We gather wanting to know where we will find the Christ who has come for us. We will find our hope where fear is overwhelmed by grace, where hatred is overwhelmed by love, where all people are overwhelmed by joy. Was in the moon of winter time when all the birds had fled that mighty gitchy manner to sent angel choirs instead before their light the stars grew dim and wandering hunters heard the hymn peace on earth Christ is born, Jesus is born, in excelsis gloria. The earliest moon of winter time is not so round and fair as was the ring of glory on the helpless infant there. The chiefs from far before him knelt with gifts of fox and beaver pelt. Peace on earth, Christ is born, Jesus is born, in excels his glory. Children of the forest free, the angel's song is true. The holy child of earth and heaven is born this day for you. Come kneel before the radiant boy who brings you beauty, peace, and joy. Peace on earth, Christ is born, Jesus is born, in excelsis gloria. Join me in prayer. In the quiet moments, in the still places, we can sometimes hear it, an urgent voice echoing through the wildernesses of the world and of our hearts, calling us to prepare and to participate in the new world that wants to be born. How can we be part of something that we haven't seen, that we struggle even to conceptualize, let alone understand? Yet still the voice calls and our hearts stir. We begin to imagine a world of joy and creativity, a world where the poor are always cared for and the rich are always generous, a world where justice guides and where mourning is always temporary, a world where the highest values are valued most highly and where priorities and agendas are set with the greatest good in mind. This world exists, Jesus, in the gospel you preached, in the stable and the cross and the empty tomb, in baptismal waters and communion meals, in your constant calling, and in your constant coming. And so we praise you for this world and for the dream that we can learn to know here and now, even as you have shown us. Amen. Friends, this is the time in which we return to God a portion 
of that with which we have been blessed. You may give to support the work of Fairview Community Church for the building up of God's beloved community through your bank's automatic bill pay service, with credit card or bank account, or even by phone. See our online giving page at ocfairviewchurch.org slash donate. In this moment and in this act, let us pledge ourselves anew to responsible stewardship of our financial resources, our time, our talent, and of the good earth we inhabit by God's grace. Let us pray. Bright morning star, your light has come, and the birth of Jesus has overwhelmed us with joy. Like the Magi of long ago, may we be drawn to you and offer you such gifts as we are able. Amen. My name is Charlie, and I'm here to tell you about the visit of the wise men, as written in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. So it is written.
What can I give him, poor as I am? Christina Rossetti penned these words more than a hundred years ago, and still the question seems timeless. What can I give him? What can you give him? Jesus Christ, child of God, maker of heaven and earth. Talk about the classic dilemma of what to give someone who has everything. Instead of the traditional doxology, some churches use a stanza of this hymn. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O God, from thee. I like these words because I believe them to be true. Jesus himself championed what is known as the debt code over against the more prevalent purity code practiced by most of the Jews in his day. It's an argument that because all that is, including life itself, was created by God and shared with us by God's grace, we are eternally indebted to God for everything. There are no hierarchies in the mind of God. None of us is better than another. None of us has a birthright to the privilege we hold. The psalmist writes, 
It is God who has made us and not we ourselves. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Our indebtedness to the creator is a great leveler. We are all, each and every one of us, sheep of God's pasture. No claim of purity, righteousness, class, race, nationality, gender, age, ability, intellect, power, wealth, or privilege makes us superior to another. God loves us, everyone equally, without favoritism. I suppose at times that can be hard for us to swallow, but it seems like we have a lovely illustration of that reality in today's text. Wise ones from the East came looking for a child who had been born king of the Jews. Note that Matthew does not say how many there are in this entourage. Tradition has limited the number to three because there were three sorts of gifts given, but we don't really know. Tradition has called them kings, though it's unlikely unlikely that they were kings in the same sense that Herod was. From the Greek original, we sometimes call them magi, though that carries all the trappings of magic with our suspicion of contemporary conjurers and tricksters. Well, scholars most commonly consider them astrologers, likely of the Persian religion of Zoroastrianism or an ancient Kurdish cult of stargazers. Again, we moderns don't give much credence to astrology, and we are not always patient with those lost out there in the stars. So it's important to remember that this was a different time and place. It was a time when the space between heaven and earth was much less clearly defined. Magic and astrology were respected disciplines in which practitioners focused on those thin spaces through which heaven invades earth, where the sacred and the profane kiss, in which wonders beyond human knowing reveal themselves in stars and stories that hold truth beyond any attempt at scientific proof or human rationalization. It appears that these wise ones from the East were highly educated, wealthy, from an elite social class. They traveled in style. They had access to courts and kings. Their caravan must have made a big impression as they entered Jerusalem. The curious thing was that they came in search of a baby born king of the Jews. Their own king, even if he was, like Herod, a puppet of Rome, must at least have equaled Herod in wealth and power. Why had they made the long, arduous journey in search of some baby born in a social and cultural backwater like Judea. What could they get from an infant king of the Jews that they couldn't receive tenfold from the princes of Persia or the king of the Kurds? While these ancient travelers were students of the stars, it's likely that they were looking for signs of the sacred beyond the routines of earthly life. Possibly they hoped for a new and different world order, much the same way we hope for such. Perhaps they believed this infant king would bring a different kind of royal rule, something akin to what the Dalai Lama represents for Tibetan Buddhists today, a kind of God king, a holy man who 
is much more concerned with compassion and care of creation than any trappings of royal wealth or power. Maybe this was crucial to their ancient wisdom an understanding of peace and well-being for all of creation that would eventually be seen in Christ's vision of God's beloved community. John Philip Newell comments on this text. In the beginning was the word, says St. John in his gospel, and all things have come into being through the word. Or in the beginning was the sound, as some other teachers put it. And the sound was with God and the sound was God. Everything then is essentially a sounding of God. The universe is like a sacred vibration, a living text that we can learn to read. And that includes the movement of the stars, the flowing of the seasons and the dreams of the night. This, real is, this realization may be the legacy of those wise ones from the East. So what did they find when the star finally led them to the newborn king? when it stopped over the place where the child was. There was no kingly palace, no royal trappings. There was a tiny baby, humbly housed with his peasant parents in a stable. Did the wise ones look at one another, asking, sh shaking their heads in astonishment, agreeing that surely there had been some mistake? Clearly, this was not the king of the Jews, or of anybody, for that matter. They must have made a wrong turn somewhere, or that evil old King Herod had given them bad directions. No, not royalty at all. But one of the things I love about this text is the transformation the unlikely education of the wise ones. In the end, Matthew proclaims they were overwhelmed with joy. Clearly they came to the realization that this was exactly the one for whom they had been searching. Not just the king of the Jews, but the light of the world. Even in his infant state, they came to recognize the word made flesh, the sound of God vibrating through the universe, concentrated in this tiny infant. If they had been less dignified, they might even have jumped for joy. Instead, they entered the house, fell to their knees, and offered homage with their gifts, magnificent gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We've heard before the significance of these gifts, gold to crown him king, frankincense offered to a deity, myrrh for anointing as God king, and ultimately for burial. From this symbolic gift giving, we've derived our own tradition of Christmas gift giving, but somehow it doesn't fit. How does the rampant consumerism of our just completed holiday season reconcile with these gifts given in tribute to the savior of the world? I can remember many, many, many years ago when I was a student intern preaching a sermon entitled, Whose Birthday Is It Anyway? As a young aspiring preacher, I may have been just a little bit strident in chiding the congregation, 
But that question still nags me. Isn't the truth of Christmas the celebration of the birth of Christ? The wise ones seemed to have understood. They brought gifts appropriate to the Christ child. They offered what they could, which in their case was both rich and rare. It wasn't the result of some crazed shopping spree. These were very specific gifts in gratitude to God for the ultimate gift of, that God had given, God's own child, light of the world, hope of healing, prince of peace, Christ of great compassion. Theirs were gifts of gratitude, as perhaps all true gifts are. Then what can I give him? What can we bring? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. But we have no shepherds or magi here this morning, nor are we particularly poor, as Christina Rossetti claims. What if we were to follow the star? What if it stopped in some improbable place? Would we see and understand? Would we jump for joy? Would we fall on our knees in homage to God who made us and saves us, who loves us and gives us life? And then what might we, in gratitude, lay before the light of the world, the word made flesh? In the end, Rossetti suggests that the one thing that any and all of us might offer is our hearts. I think heart here is symbolic of the very core of our being. It's what Jesus was referring to when he reminded us that we were made to love God with our whole being and to love our neighbors as ourselves. But before we reach that point, do we need to secure our hearts to realize that they are, in fact, worth giving? John Philip, and John Philip Newell again wonders, do you know that you are loved? Do you know it in the heart of your being? For he says, this is the truth of epiphany that you are loved, that you are part of this beautiful light of God, that you too are called to shine for the healing of the world. What can I give him? I can let my own heart light shine in concert with the light of the world. In the end, the wise ones are warned to find a new way home. The trappings of power and might are not trustworthy. The old order will no longer hold. For us in our time, once we have entrusted our gifts with Christ and given our lives to following him, we too must leave for our home country by another road. Bruce Epperly recognizes this and comments, we are on another road and we have to find our own stars to guide us. We can't let, as Isaiah proclaims, our fears of darkness dampen our lights. When political leaders lack moral compass, we must supply a new and ethical spiritual direction. When religious leaders sell out their faith for power and the return of the good old days, we must chart a different course, not letting go of the name Christian, 
despite the foolishness of popular Christian leaders, we must redefine Christian faith for our time to transform the world and to witness to those who have been traumatized and scandalized by captivity of the church in our times. What can I give him? My own heart's shining that following the Christ child and reflecting Christ's brilliance, it might light the way for me and others to a new and everlasting home in God's beloved community, laid out for us all from the beginning of the time, beginning of all time, a place where everyone is welcome at the table. Overwhelmed with joy like those ancient wise ones from the East, let us each and all offer the gifts that we can in gratitude for all that is and in hope for all that will be. Amen. You who do repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors, you who desire to walk in newness of life according to the commands of God and the grace of Jesus Christ, draw near with reverence, praise, and thanksgiving to this table of our Christ. Let us come to this table not because we must, but because we may, not to profess that any of us by our own merits are righteous, but to confess that all of us stand in need of the forgiving grace of God. Let us come not to support any division in Christ's church, but to declare that at this table, all who believe in God are one. Let us come not to support an opinion, but to celebrate a presence. This is Christ's table. Come now, let us share the feast. We read that Christ Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and, went and broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the bread of life for you and me and all the world. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim Christ's death until Christ comes. This is the cup of salvation for you and me and all the world. Let us pray. Bless this the bread of life. Bless this the cup of salvation. Bless this your welcome table. Bless us your people, O God. Let this sacred meal nourish us body and soul so that we might live our lives in holy communion with you and in blessed community with all creation. Amen.
grain for the fields scattered and grown gathered to one for all one bread one body one Lord of all one cup of blessing which we bless and, and we the many throughout the earth we are one body in this one Lord. radiant morning star you are both guidance and mystery. Visit our rest with disturbing dreams and our journeys with strange companions. Grace us with the hospitality to open our hearts and our homes to visitors filled with unfamiliar wisdom, bearing profound and unusual gifts. Amen.